hello and welcome to the Gritty Nurse Podcast, an unfiltered discussion related to nursing and healthcare. My name is Amy. And my name is Sarah. And we are your podcast hosts. Today we'll be talking about um, lateral nursing violence. So this is um, part two of our three-part series. And actually we'll be talking about experiences. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about our weekend because we actually haven't spoken all weekend. No, we haven't. No, we just sort of texted here and there, but not actually had a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Anything exciting happen? I feel tired. Uh, like, oh, no. <laughs> I think it just started with New Year's and, you know, staying up late from New Year's and then um, had to take my son to the emergency room the other day. So that was, there was a lot happening with that. Oh, yeah. We did speak <laughs> about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Long story short, he swallowed a bone. He's fine now. Oh, God. We, we are not going to be eating fish for a while. Let's just say that. Oh, no. That's that, that's always, like, the scariest thing. I, because my parents are Jamaican, they used to say, like, if we ever f- swallowed a fish bone, the best way to get this fish bone out was to eat something called hardo bread. So you chomp down on this, like, really thick bread to, to hopefully, like, push the bone down. I don't know if it ever worked, but um, it was definitely one of the things that my parents taught me if I ever had a fish bone caught in my throat. So, Is that cornbread by any chance? No, it's like, um, it's hard to describe. It's just kind of a very doughy bread and they just call it hard dough bread. It's like this, it's like a Jamaican staple. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to uh, let you try some someday. It, it really just tastes like regular bread, but a little bit more moist, I guess. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, other than that, the kids have just been sick with diarrhea. Don't know if that's too much information, <laughs> oh but God. that's why I feel tired. Like I just want this. <laughs> no. I just want this week to be over already, and it's only just started. <laughs> well, the thing is, does that mean they're going to be like going? To, they won't be able to go to daycare. <laughs> well, I think my son is over it now, so he can go back. And we thought my daughter was fine, but she's not. So my mom had already watched her for Thursday and Friday of last week. And then we just told her, you know, go home, everything's fine. And then I just had to call her back again and ask if she could come to uh, babysit again on Monday. So I'm really hoping this will be the end of it because <laughs> they're really fine otherwise. They have no problem fighting over toys or doing the things they normally do, destroying right. the house. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of been my week and my weekend. Oh my goodness. Sounds like it was a full with a lot of busyness (laughs) to to say the least. I think that's the easiest way to put it. Yeah. And how was your week? How was your weekend? Um, not too bad. I've been off for quite a bit. So I've been off since, I guess it would have been December 27th. And I actually don't go back to work until I guess it would be January 7th. So I've been off. Um, I had a very interesting Saturday morning. Again, of course, here comes my jujitsu stories. So I was actually sparring with another female, but she was a higher belt class. And it was definitely more challenging than any of the other um, times I've sparred. And actually, I ended up landing on my head somehow. So it was kind of weird. Um, We were sparring and I had her, um, she had me in something called close guard. And uh, I kind of was standing up and her head was kind of pinned up against the wall essentially she kind of um flipped me over and then kind of landed on my head so I have quite tight shoulders right now quite a couple bruises on my shoulders and back I actually ended up sparring with her again for another five minutes afterwards and she was trying to teach me a couple things but um I definitely can learn a thing or two uh from her so it was it was very um I'm trying Mm -hmm. to think of the right word it was um a good learning experience let's put it that way (laughs) That sounds kind of traumatic. Like you could have suffered some kind of well, neck injury I mean, or I did kind concussion. of ball myself up, but I did hear my husband like screech out because he was again sitting on the sidelines when we were sparring and he was like, oh, are you okay? And she looked, she looked very mortified. And um, I was like, no, 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 I'm good. I'm good. But of course now the pain always sets in like 24 to 48 hours later. So, but it's all good. I will be back tomorrow and Wednesday and Saturday so I guess it hasn't really deterred me just makes me it just ignites the fire even more so this is like a three day (laughs) this is a three time uh, a week yeah I try to to go about three days a week Um, it helps me with my uh, my um, emotional issues (laughs) 
Oh, okay. Speaking of speaking of emotional issues, Got it. we're going to talk about our experiences. And, and you know, we didn't actually really um, go over this beforehand. Sometimes we kind of talk about jotting some notes and things down. But do you want to kind of ta- attack this in terms of looking at it? Our experiences from a nursing student perspective, a bedside RN nurse ex- perspective, and then from maybe like a leadership role perspective. Do you think that's kind of fair? Yeah, I think so. Do you want to sort of take turns or... How do you? Yeah, I think. Okay. I think because this episode is more about storytelling, I think it'll be easier for us just to kind of take turns and jump in. And but I think this is more about just actually talking about our experiences and and hoping people can kind of connect with us. And if they've ever had these types of experiences and they don't know whether it is bullying or harassment or lateral violence, maybe us kind of speaking about ours kind of brings light to the fact that maybe they're experiencing the same things as well and that they're not alone. Yeah, so I think I I alluded to sort of my experience as a student in terms of having a preceptor that wasn't totally supportive of having a student or teaching. So I felt like whenever I asked a question, it would be met with sort of frustration and a loud sigh, and it just wasn't a great learning experience. But I think the real, the first real episode I can think of is when I was working as a staff nurse in one of my first roles in postpartum. <laughs> and what I noticed is that there was a lot of favoritism with assignments. And I'm not sure if you've experienced this, but just, but I almost feel like there was different groupings based on your ethnicity. So, you know, there were certain groups of nurses that like to stick together with other nurses. And when I was working with the nurses that uh, didn't quite see me as one of them, then I would always get a tougher assignment. And it's one of those yeah. things that you can't always prove, but you know that you always just seem to have a harder assignment than everyone else, or you'll you'll be the first to get an admission, even though they say that they are um, making sure that everyone gets one, you just always seem to be the first one getting an admission. And then I have to say that there was a situation where um, I was getting report from a nurse and she had said to me, you know, I brought the patient up to go to the bathroom and then uh, this happened and this happened. And I said to her, so you brought the patient up to the bathroom. Did she actually go to the bathroom? Oh, because, they absolutely are. Um, yeah. Taking her to the bathroom to void and the patient actually voiding, I felt like we're two Whoa. different things. And then she just came back with me like, I'm sorry if uh, English isn't your first language, but I already told you the answer. And I'm like, hang on, hang on, hang on. We're not talking about that at all. I just asked a simple question and I wanted to clarify what you had said, but it just became this whole spiral of things that it didn't need to be. And I felt like that was just really unnecessary. So that was sort of... She was also attacking not only... She wasn't just attacking your intelligence at that point. She was attacking your, your culture. Right. So because I thought that was drawing the line. You're that, oh my gosh. Yeah. And wow. so, so when that happened, I turned around and there happened to be another nurse that was walking down the hall. And I said, did you just hear what happened? And she totally just bowed out. She said, you know what? I'm not getting involved. I didn't hear this. And she was someone that Helpful. I thought she was really, she was supportive of me in the past with you know, working together. But I felt like in that moment, I lost a lot of respect for her because I was really looking for her support and she just didn't want to get involved. She just kept going on and just totally ignored what was happening. And and I think even thinking about that perspective of like people bowing out, I think there's certain times where it's acceptable to be like, you know, I'm not getting involved in that type of conversation or whatever the case may be. But I think if you're seeing that your colleague is being rightfully like they're being picked on or they're like that that was pretty clear to me to be like for for that person if they had heard it to be like hey that's actually not acceptable because that's not even workplace incivility that's actually harassment and that's harassment based on discrimination (laughs) that's like a whole other ball game that's unreal yeah and I think that just speaks to um what we were saying with bullying is that if you see it happening um, you don't want to be a bystander. You really should speak up and say something because for every instance of bullying or harassment, we know that there are people who have witnessed it that maybe didn't feel comfortable saying something or doing anything about it, but it's really all of our jobs to make sure that we work in a safe environment. Oh, absolutely. And and as much as bullying could be very isolated in work where it's like some of these things, and we'll probably hit on some of the experiences where 
it's really like you're you're only you're the only person in the room bullies tend to thrive off of groups too right they they like to have that group effect where they're either being jeered on or whatnot or you know other people think it's acceptable or they think that they're cool because they're they can say that these things outwards to you and you might not say anything but really it's unacceptable and I think we just need to call it out way more often than we do like I think it should be called out every single time absolutely and I think it takes practice for the person that's being bullied in terms of what they need to say to be clear that this is not acceptable. And also for people that are bystanders, what can you say to either the um, the victim or the person that's doing the bullying? What can you do to sort of um, make the situation better? So, for sure. <clears throat> and I mean, I, I think in our next podcast, we'll probably dig into a little bit how to combat it and how to deal with the mental health aspect. But really... It's just unreal that, and I, it's almost like, did that nurse even realize what she was saying to you was racially motivated, was really a form of discrimination? Right. So, I mean, in my case, I never really got resolution to that because I ended up following up with the uh, diversity and inclusion department who reached out to this nurse many times and she just never responded and she was working casual. So she just never responded. And I, I guess, you know. I don't think she works there very often anymore, but it just never really, I never got any closure to that. Yeah, that's not acceptable that she was able to kind of slide under the radar like that. And that's really where we, we really do look to our managers and our occupational health department. And like you said, diversity inclusion, and not all organizations have that, which is kind of scary. But I mean, where were the leaders when that was happening? And the fact that you didn't get re- resolution. So like, how does, have you ever had any more experiences like that? Or that was really your main kind of experience as a bedside RN? Well, that was my main experience in terms of experiencing racism. Like I've had other issues, um, which I can get into later, but that was, um, that was the most significant one I could think of in terms wow. of, in terms of having my, I don't know what the word is, but, you know, just feeling really violated and feeling unsupported um, from a diversity standpoint. Oh, my God. It makes me want to, like, reach back and be like, Sarah, where were you? Let me, like, jump into, like, the the past and, like, jump out of a closet and be like, oh, how dare you say that to her, you awful bitch. But, of course, like (laughs) that probably wouldn't make things better. But, like, I just feel for you because I think that's – it's unreal that – that that actually had to happen to you. And we're supposed to be in a professional environment and there's definitely no place for racism. Yeah, absolutely. So do you want to tell me about one of your experiences that you've had in terms of bullying or harassment? Sure. I uh, let me kind of bring it back to like, I don't think we touched on being a a nursing student because I don't really have a lot to, to draw from in terms of bullying from the perspective when I was a student, but the the things that I can kind of think of, that's not really a story, but is more like, um, I think when I was a student, most of the bullying was actually probably from my preceptor. And I think you could either get a really good preceptor or you can get a really crappy preceptor. And I never get the, the fact that nurses don't really get what that role looks like because they have to realize that at one point in time too, they were at that lear- that you know, learning everything was new level. And uh, I can't really think of anything specific, but most of my experiences that were negative were with um, my preceptor. So I think I did speak in one episode previously about an insulin and a medication error and how that preceptor kind of responded to me instead of, we both essentially made the error because I was learning and she kind of just dumped it all on me being like, oh, you know, it's your fault instead of being like, Oh, this is a learning opportunity. Like this was an independent double check and this is how we can learn together. And we let's put this into the IRS system that she kind of, you know, made it out to be my own problem. And then really, if I think about how the relationship continued, it just continued to sour. So things didn't get better. And I don't know if it was based on, and and I don't want to be ageist, but she was a younger preceptor. And I don't know if, um, maybe it's also about learning, about people in general. Cause I think she just, from there, she just kind of cut, like cut all ties with me really. And just treated me very coldly each time. So it was more, I guess it'd be more workplace incivility. 
Um, but that that's my only really real student type of perspective. But as a bedside RN, oh man, I have a plethora of stories, but I'm only going to kind of dive into one. I remember being a newer L&D nurse and um, one of the things, like you said, you notice those kind of clicks, you know, those certain types of groups. So like there was the night, like each, I guess, shift or rotation had their, their crew of nurses and, and there were some lines that were easier to work on than other lines. And um, I remember working on this one particular line with this one particular nurse. I, she just had it out for me. Um, let's call her um, CD. I don't know. Anyways, this particular nurse, every time I spoke to her, it was either an eye roll or a smart ass comment or. Um, oh, I totally. Information. I totally and I feel think, it. I've. I've. And, yeah. And the thing is, like, I think people don't understand that withholding information is also considered bullying. So, for example, she was supposed to um, kind of follow up after me when I went into a patient's room. So maybe I went in to do a vaginal exam or whatever the case may be. And I'd be like, oh, um, you did a vaginal exam prior. She's got an epidural. So what did you get? And she's like, oh, I don't know. What did you get? And I'm like, well, I, I think it was like four. And she's like, <laughs> And she's like, oh, she's closed. And I'm like, but now we're at the nursing station and there's a whole bunch of people there. And now I'm being embarrassed that way, right? Instead of being like, hey, you know, let me show you where the cervix is and help you a little bit out to kind of, as opposed to kind of humiliating me in front of a group of people. I also remember on nights, there were times where like I was on this particular nursing line and nobody from this line would talk to me. So I was like on my own. and working a whole like spe- specifically working in labor and delivery it's such a team oriented environment i remember so many shifts working full 12 hour nights with no one saying a word to me like i'd go in for a delivery and i'd never get that second baby nurse coming in that is ridiculous that is ridiculous like i remember you telling me this but i still have trouble believing it but i no, i seriously like it was unreal like i would i would go in I'd call and say, uh, you know, um, this patient's delivering, physician would come in, and no second nurse. And then I'd come out and be like, hey, you know, like, can anybody help me? They're like, oh, no, 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 like, we're all busy, sorry, no one can come in to help you. And I was like, what the hell? And then someone else would deliver, and, you know, three nurses, two nurses are in the room, and I'm like, what the heck is going on? And one time that really stood out in my mind was... And of course, it always happens where you have that patient that's delivering at like seven o'clock. So, you know, your shift is done at 730 in the morning. And I'm just like, OK, you know what? I, I've been with her through this whole night. I'm going to I really want to see this through. And it was that actual outgoing shift that was coming on that same line that never really spoke to me. And um, nobody came in again. And I was just like, this is unreal. That so is I ended scary. Up staying that is almost scary. like nine o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And like, what if there was a code pink? What if there was a situation where the patient had like a PPA? Should I need an extra set of hands? Nobody came in. And I remember just being like, so I um, did the baby vitals, got baby cleaned up and wrapped up in skin to skin with mom. Then I went and did like all the funnel checks on mom. Like I did all like my four funnel checks was just like an hour and I'm like, looking at the time, I'm like, my shift is like, no one has even come in to take in report, to take report from me. And I remember going out and like, I put all my charting in and it's like now like nine o'clock. And I was just like, so the patient needs to be transferred. And they're like, oh, I'm sorry. We totally forgot that you were in there. That no is way. crazy. That is ridiculous. There's no ridiculous. way that they would have forgot that I was in there. And, and it was just that particular team just was a nightmare to work with and I just remember and they were the same team I think I actually posted a tweet about like a scary um scary um it was like a scary meme from the grudge where um one night shift we were all talking or I overheard them talking about room 44 of a patient who um had 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 a poor outcome in that room and they're like oh this room is haunted and then they were assigning sleep rooms of course it's yeah, sorry, nurses don't sleep my night. Anyways, they were assignment assigned the sleep room and they're like, Oh, Amy, you're gonna sleep in room 44. And I was like, Well, um, weren't you guys just and they're like, Oh no, no, everybody has to sleep in room 44 the first time they work here. And I was just like, Wow, um, okay. 
So I, I remember going and getting my blanket and like curling up and being terrified. And I could hear them snickering outside the room and laughing. And like all of that stuff was just unnecessary. And it really taught me how not to treat other people. And I think, and that's so silly. Like I shouldn't have be have to be treated poorly to know that that's not the right way to treat people. And it was just like, they found it okay. They found it okay to be in this type of clique and to, to treat other people this way. So but yeah. I, was a, I was a brand new nurse. It was just unacceptable but I didn't have or I didn't have no one really equipped me with how do I deal with this and how do I go about kind of coming out at this from a different angle so it was it was really really stressful and um I actually ended up leaving that job I don't blame you one bit I mean I'm actually I'm actually surprised that you lasted as long as you did that sounds like an absolutely horrible environment to be in and never mind trying to function but if you had a question about anything God forbid that they would actually answer your question or not give you a false answer to make you even in a worse situation than you were. Oh, absolutely. And the one thing I can, I guess I could credit was the reason I stayed for as long as I did was because there were other sub, there were other lines that were excellent. Like some of, some of the people that I've learned from that I, I could, I still talk to them this day and, and I, I have nothing but respect and love for them because they took me under their wing and they really said, Hey, you know what? Let's make you the best L and D nurse you possibly can be. And I really felt um, those people impacted my life. And I guess that's why I stayed as long as I did, because really I'm still friends with them to this day. But I mean, that one particular line was quite a nightmare. And I think I actually did um, reach out to management to, to change my part time line so I, I didn't really fall on those shifts, but yeah, they didn't really, they weren't very helpful. I just wish that there had been even one person that was supportive of you, that wasn't trying to bully you and make your life hell, how much different your experience would have been. Like if there had been just one person that you knew you could trust that was safe um, and you could just tell anything to, you know what I mean? Um, There were two nurses. They were my rocks really. Like I, I don't know if I would have continued nursing if I didn't have those two nurses who continued to show me new things and kind of lead me down the path of saying like, you know, this is going to be okay. Things are going to get better. And, you know, let me just kind of continue to help you and mentor you. So there were some people, some really great people along the way. It's just my initial experience was quite horrible. And I feel like Mm -hmm. there are a lot of nurses who come out of nursing school and their first experience as an RN or an RPN or LPN are quite horrible. And, and it's not, it shouldn't be the status quo, but for whatever reason, it's so ingrained in this culture. And, but I mean, I don't know. What do you think? Well, I don't know either. Like we've talked about several theories that we have in terms of why this Mm -hmm. occurs and, you know, part of it might just be cyclical. So if you were bullied in the past, especially as a new nurse, It's acceptable behavior. It's normal behavior in your mind. And you just perpetuate the cycle without really thinking about why this occurs. Or maybe the fact that you have the power to stop this uh, from occurring again is within your power. Like There are so many instances where you may experience bullying, whether it's outright or whether it's sort of passive aggressive, that you could actually say something and have an impact on that person's life and really determine whether or not this person will become a nurse or whether they decide it's it's too much for them. Right, right. Yeah, and I think even kind of thinking back to like, I did do a little bit of anthropology, that I think there's actually a theory called um, ethical relativism. relativism, um, And it kind of talks about the culture that kind of perpetuates this type of cyclical behavior. But the thing is, even like I, I, I try to think back to like, okay, let's let's go back to like nursing one hundred and one, like with Flor- Florence Nightingale and those guys, and be like, why, where did this really originate? And I feel like it's it's even beyond that. It's, I mean, I think we we would probably need to have some type of like psychology expert that would be able to talk a little bit about um female females in the workplace and why um really it's it's more seen and more prevalent. Um, this type of bullying in female dominated careers and um, nursing tends to be female centric, female dominated. And I'm hoping it's uh, going to start to change, but we do see that um, with these female dominated careers that um, 
women tend to have this incivility, harassment type of bullying actions towards one another. It's unfortunate. Well, I'm I'm curious as to whether this is as prevalent in teaching, for example, because we know there are a lot of female teachers, right. but I feel like the, the nature of the work is different. So we're dealing with high pressure, literally life or death situations, which is hard enough in and of itself. But then to add on this layer of woman on woman violence, um, it just doesn't make sense to me. It almost intensifies everything that's already well, happening. Really, if I think about it. So like I did teach also and um, same shit, different pile. I don't know if it's just because I was teaching in a nursing program. So I was still surrounded by um, other nurses, but I felt like it was the, the, the same stuff went down. Like the, the talking behind people's backs, it was just unreal. So I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, yeah. I'm not confident that it would be any different in a, a different type of environment. I know it's really unfortunate. It's really unfortunate. Another example I had just uh, in one of my leadership positions was uh, what I would consider my first real um, experience with bullying. So I'm just going to change the person's name here. So I'm going to call her Lisa. So when I started my first um, nursing leadership uh, position. This person was the previous person that had my position. So you think, um, oh, this is a perfect example of how you could, you know, ease into the role. The person that had it before was still there. Right. But I feel like it very quickly changed. And it's it's interesting that you talked about withholding information. So instead of having that wonderful transition that I expected, I was met with a lot of um, conversations around well shouldn't you know that you should know that you uh you should be here and you should be getting to know people um oh you're never around and then when I sort of brought that concern to my manager she said you know you need to book a meeting with her you need to talk to her and uh you know get the information that you need Mm. but she would do really sneaky things like ignoring my meeting request when I would send it through Outlook or she would accept it and just not show up or when I tried to meet with her um, in her office with a, you know, just trying to meet with her because she wouldn't uh, respond to my invites. She would purposely be on the phone and not be able to talk. And then just it started to unravel. I guess she would put me down in front of other people, make comments about my physical appearance. Wow. Um, she would tell other people that, well, I think she was purposely trying to shut me out. So she wouldn't introduce me to anyone that I didn't know. So I had to make that introduction on my own. And she would even say to other people, Oh, I don't know what she does. She just hangs out with the lactation consultants. Oh my God. Which they were really the only group that was welcoming to me. Um, because I think they sort of felt excluded from a lot of the conversation as well. Wow. And I remember spending days crying in my office because I was so upset with what was happening, but I also felt that this person had made alliances with all the right people, including um, people in human resources. So I didn't feel comfortable going to HR with any of the, anything that was happening. Yeah. And I actually did reach out to the person, um, someone who is a previous educator, just because I wanted to sort of know what her experience was like uh, with this person, this Lisa person. And um, it took a bit of time for her to warm up to me. But once she did, she told me that the five years that she spent working there was hell. She said, I will never go back. It was hell. My husband was so tired of hearing me complain about work. I am so glad I'm gone now. Yikes. So I have spent a lot of time trying to understand why this happened to me and I just think it's not personal I think it could have been anyone and for whatever reason um nobody would have been welcomed in this role so I think she was just jealous and she didn't want to let go of her position but for various political reasons she did and I just I feel very scarred by the whole experience like I felt like I was suffering from PTSD for a while wow because she always made it, uh, she would always go out of her way to um, see what time I was coming and going. And if I left even 20 minutes early, she would make a point of saying this to other people behind my back. So it really um, 
made me feel paranoid a lot a lot about the amount of work I was putting in and what people would think of me. Yeah, it begs the question, why does someone feel that they need to act that way to someone else? Like, it's just like, how do you think bringing someone else down or talking about someone behind someone else's back or withholding information or just treating someone in um, it, like not civilly that 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 would make you look like a better person like I think she just sounds like this arch enemy arch nemesis type of person and all of her behaviors just seem completely unwarranted but the 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 strange thing is they it sounded also like she built relationships with the right people so even if you were to say something maybe people yeah. wouldn't believe you so that's that's another form of I guess bullying and harassment but that's it's almost like next level yeah I totally agree and I feel like it was her way of just moving up so her way of moving up and looking good was to put other people down and the work the job itself became more about this whole situation than the actual work so I sort of went into this naively thinking that if I kept my head down and I did good work and I worked hard that people would notice and we could just take the attention off of all this drama. But it was almost like half of the time I was at this job was spent trying to navigate the alliances oh and God. you know who who was on whose side and um, who was talking behind whose back and what were they saying. So it just was taking so much energy out of me emotionally yeah that I felt like I, I had to leave this job yeah that's unreal and very unfortunate and it's just kind of like how do other people in leadership not see that as well it just makes me think that their heads are so far buried up their asses too that they're all doing the same thing they can't notice well the sad thing is I would I would say that she was very intimidating so Maybe some people did realize, but they were also afraid to call her out or say anything wow. because of um, the same thing potentially happening to them in terms of how I was being treated. That's crazy and super, super unfortunate. Mm -hmm. <sighs> but you're in a different place now. <laughs> I am in a different place. And um, I mean... <laughs>